Hello aviation fans, Sky here, and today we are going to take a new path for the channel. Let's take a look at business aviation. This breed of luxury and expensive workhorses, or maybe just toys, was born as you could guess along with other jet airplanes. Today we look at one of the first representatives of this class. Lockheed Jetstar is a business jet developed by Lockheed in the late 1950s. Jetstar is, in fact, the first serial business jet that gave a start to a rapid growth of this type of aircraft and at the same time remained one of the best models in the class for quite a long time. Let's get acquainted. The L-329 or L-1329 project was deployed inside Lockheed in the early 1950s, while in the aviation industry one after another first appeared the military jets followed by civilian airliners. Not having sufficient resources to create a full-fledged commercial airliner, as did for example Boeing and Douglas, Lockheed set their sights on creating a small plane that could carry only a few people but also have the flight performance of big brothers. The civilian sector was potentially fairly profitable, but jets were still quite an exotic concept and there was a risk that such an aircraft would not find demand. However, the government structures, especially the military, at that time were grasping at everything new in the industry with great enthusiasm. It was the military who were originally expected to become the main customer. In the mid-1950s, the Air Force initiated the Utility Transport Experimental, the UTX program, within which they wanted to receive a fleet of small jets capable of carrying cargo and passengers, as well as performing various special tasks. The main participants were Lockheed with their Jetstar, McDonnell with their Model 119, and also North American with their Sabre Liner. The simplest option turned out to be the Sabre Liner, a fairly light twin-engine airplane accommodating up to seven passengers. North American decided not to rush into adventures and created exactly what the military wanted with minimal risk, moreover saving money and applying some solutions already tested on their own jet fighters, the famous F-86 Sabre. The company emphasized this kinship, even the names were similar. The McDonnell aircraft, unlike the competitor, had a rather bold design. A low-wing aircraft with four engines suspended under the wing on an aircraft this small, quite avant-garde, but also quite interesting. Lockheed decided to look for middle ground, to take some risks, but without showing off too much. Jetstar had a more classic design, with engines in the rear fuselage section, a small swoop wing, and a cruciform tail. In general layout, it was similar to the recently created French Sudovitz Yon Caraval that was showing quite a decent performance. By 1957, at the Lockheed plant in Burbank, were assembled two prototypes equipped with a pair of British Bristol Siddeley Orpheus turbojet engines. At that time, these engines had just appeared and seemed like a real miracle, later becoming the basis of power plants of various aircraft. In September 1957, the Jetstar prototype equipped with these engines made its maiden flight. The first prototype, even by today's standards, seems to be quite an ordinary business jet. The second one was more unusual. Its feature was an increased range, achieved by integrating two fuel tanks into the wing, something like an optional long-range version for the future operations. Being very pleased with the British engines, Lockheed wanted to continue buying them for their aircraft, but the military, the main customer, demanded that the power plant has to be American. The attempt to set up production of the Orpheus in the United States failed. Bristol Siddeley offered either direct sales or a very small localization, which did not suit the buyers. As a result, the engines had to be changed, which caused a lot of difficulties and the need to redesign the plane. Lockheed performed the re-engining and installed the Pratt Whitney JT-12 engines. The problem was that the JT-12 was significantly less powerful than the Orpheus. The British were providing more than 20 kN of thrust, while the Americans couldn't even reach 15 kN. The already mentioned Sabre liner was equipped with these engines, but it is worth noting, the Lockheed model was heavier, more than twice as heavy. Two motors were not nearly enough. It was possible to try the three-engine scheme, but it required a serious review of the design and its prospects were vague. There were no machines like the Boeing 727, Hawker Siddeley Trident or 2154 yet. As a result, the engineers chose the four-engine scheme the revision of a number of elements and the installation of two more engines in addition to the row of the already existing two. Such a scheme was of course a compromise, but was considered promising. It was later implemented on large aircraft, for example the Vickers VC-10 and Il-62. 
The plane became larger and heavier, but in terms of economics and flight performance, the Jetstar was quite good for the 1960s. Also, four engines proved to be useful in the market. The reliability of jet engines of that time was not encouraging. Buyers were afraid of disasters in case of their failure. Besides, the twin-engine aircraft had limitations in flight, and this plane had four brand new motors. Should be cool. In 1959, the work was completed. Serious versions began to fly as early as 1960. Ironically, after a while, Orpheus came to America nonetheless, and was produced by the Curtis Wright Corporation under the index TJ-37. Even more ironic was the fact that, after all this time of torturing the aviators, the military in the end severely restricted the UTX program. Congress decided that the Air Force budgets were too big and demanded to reduce some of the costs. The military chose the simplest North American project as the winner of the tender. The Lockheed model also received orders, but only for 16 planes. Although the Sable Liner had won, it didn't get the desired contract. The deliveries were limited to just a couple of hundred planes, although initially it was planned to purchase almost 1500. And while the McDonnell 119 was very cool, it turned out to be too exotic and in fact never saw the series production. Such a turn was a problem for Lockheed. To invest so much time and effort for the sake of a dozen and a half delivered machines was offensive. However, they did end up with a plane on their hands, which moreover was pretty good. And since the state doesn't want to buy, let's just sell it to the private sector. The risks of entering the commercial aviation were still quite high, but the plane was already made. In the end, Lockheed came to the civilian market. The decision that technically made Jetstar the world's first commercially available business jet. Let's take a closer look at it. Being the first business jet created back in the 1950s, the Jetstar, however, can be considered quite a typical aircraft of this class by modern standards, although containing a number of exotic solutions. The aircraft has a classic design with a low, small sweep wing and engines located in the rear of the fuselage. The horizontal tail unit is located above the fuselage, not to interfere with the engines. And it is cruciform, not T-shaped, which is more common. The swept wing is equipped with slats and flaps, which allowed it to maintain a fairly low minimum speed during takeoffs and landings. Also, the aircraft received an aerodynamic brake located at the bottom of the fuselage. The aircraft landing gear has a classic three-leg design. To reduce weight and save some space, each leg was initially equipped with one wheel. However, several incidents showed the weakness of this solution, and the bogies eventually became two-wheeled. The power plant of the series aircraft was represented by four Pratt Whitney JT-12 turbojets. These engines were fairly good and easy to maintain, but like all motors of that time, were not very fuel efficient. The problem of increased fuel consumption was solved by increasing its stock. The Jetstar received additional fuel tanks integrated into the wing. This was enough for flights over distances of more than 4000 kilometers, or 2200 miles. Not global travel, of course, but for domestic flights it is pretty good. In the 1970s, the need to improve the efficiency of the power plant, mainly the economic efficiency, coupled with more strict regulations for noise in the environment, required another remotorization. In addition, the world was conquered by the turbofan engines, the latest squeak of fashion. The updated Jetstar 2 model received Garrett TFE 731 turbofan engines, and the fuel tanks were redesigned so that the upper surfaces of the wing would not be interrupted by them. The plane was very good. Improved aerodynamics, increased by 10% engine thrust, as well as the modernized onboard systems allowed to increase passenger comfort and to gain weight. With a takeoff weight of just over 20 tons, or 44.5 thousand pounds, it could accommodate 8 to 10 passengers, plus two pilots and a flight attendant. At the same time, the aircraft was able to reach speeds of up to 547 miles per hour, or 883 kilometers per hour, and fly 2600 miles, or 4800 kilometers. Lockheed was producing the Jetstar II since 1976 until 1979. About 40 aircraft of this model saw the sky. In total, until 1980, 202 aircraft were released. The first two prototypes were assembled at Lockheed plant in Burbank, California. However, it was decided to launch the series production at the site in Georgia. 
Curiously, the first prototype, back in the 60s after certification, continued to be used as a Lockheed corporate transport, in particular flying around the Vice President of Advanced Development Projects, Kelly Johnson, a guy with a very interesting biography. He was the initiator of the Jetstar project, and before that he led the F-104 Starfighter program. He was the first head of the Skunk Wars division and one of the fathers of many of their birds, including the U-2 and SR-71. The main initial customer, the US Air Force, in the end bought only 16 planes of the C-140 modification, which were used to transport military command, as well as to provide communications and participate in various aerial tests. These aircraft continued to be actively operated up until the early 1990s. Greater demand came from the commercial market, where the Jetstars were used as corporate and personal transport. The planes were loved by many American celebrities of the time. Frank Sinatra was flying on one, and Elvis Presley bought these planes twice at different times. Jetstars were operated in the parks of several airlines and government structures of the USA, Canada and Mexico, as well as in several countries of Asia and the Middle East. During the 1960s and 70s, the Lockheed Jetstar was considered one of the best business jets, which due to its mass and decent internal volumes, was classified as a medium-sized aircraft and was very comfortable. Nevertheless, the rapid development of aviation technology, the emergence of many models of competitors, as well as the obsolescence of the concept of a four-engine aircraft of this size, made the Jetstar irrelevant. In the 1980s, they slowly began to leave the market. Now, of course, most of these aircraft are decommissioned, recycled or transferred to museums. But some Jetstar 2 machines occasionally appear in the sky, reminding the bystanders who is one of the ancestors of the modern flying limos. This is where we stop today. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. Our story is only beginning. Fast flights and soft landings to you.